welcome to another episode of Public Health Matters with the Uncas Health District. I'm your host, Patrick McCormick, Director of Health at the Uncas Health District, and I am with Russ Melmed, who is from the Ledgelite Health District, who is nice enough to join me today. Russ is an epidemiologist. Russ's title is Epidemiologist and Supervisor of Health Education and Community Outreach. So he said his, uh, his title actually goes around the back of the card <laughs> when he hands long. it out. <laughs> So welcome, Russ. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. And we're going to talk about the always exciting topic of hepatitis. Oh, my favorite subject lately. <laughs> and specifically hepatitis A. Um, so maybe you could start out by telling me a little bit about what hepatitis is. Sure. So hepatitis, generally speaking, is an inflammation of the liver. Okay. And, and it's not always caused by a virus. It can be caused by other things. But in general, when the liver becomes inflamed and becomes diseased, that's hepatitis. Okay. Now we have hepatitis A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. So what's the hepatitis A? Why are we so concerned about that? Well, so, so I'm, a, I'm not a virologist. I can't <laughs> tell you the structure of the proteins of the different hepatitis viruses. I'm no, sure no, virologists do people can, really want to hear about that. That I'm would sure. bore your, your <laughs> listeners or your audience, I think. So um, the, the, there are a bunch of different hepatitis viruses. The, okay. the key thing is they all do cause hepatitis, inflammation of the liver. Right. Um, from my perspective, the main differences for those hepatitis viruses, the way they're transmitted, mm -hmm. and some of the you know, and, and the, some of the early symptoms like hepatitis B and C, yep. they're primarily transmitted through contact with blood. Okay. You know, the virus replicates a lot, and it's found a lot in the blood, and that's typically how it's transmitted. Hepatitis A is a little bit different. Okay. It, it can be transmitted through the blood. Most of the time, it's transmitted uh, through exposure to feces because the virus has shed a lot in feces. When you go to the bathroom, if somebody has hepatitis A and they're shedding the virus in their feces and they don't wash their hands, it can be spread through contact with food, especially if that person's a food handler. Right. Somebody doesn't wash their hands, you can spread it through direct contact. You know, we shook hands earlier. Right. If I hadn't washed my hands and I had hepatitis and then you went and you know, ate a donut. You'd be sharing. Yeah, you'd be sharing my hepatitis. <laughs> so, so that's typically how hepatitis A virus is spread. And, um, and we see it a lot with contaminated water. Okay. So, you know, we have chlorinated water for the most part in this country. Right. Um, and that kills hepatitis A virus, so it's mm -hmm. really not a huge concern here, um, through, spread through water. But in other parts of the world where chlorination is not routine, mm -hmm. you see a lot of outbreaks of hepatitis A virus spread through contaminated water because especially if you have, you know, sewage that's being dumped upstream and people are drinking from the, from the water downstream in a river and they're not, they're not treating it, right. you get big outbreaks in some parts of the world. And so. even localized. I mean, I know the, you know, the septic system issue when we're dealing with, you know, the local health department going out and citing somebody because their septic system fails mm -hmm. when their neighbor's well is all of 75 feet away. Um, That's you right. You get, a, you get an outbreak, right? You're, you get, uh, you get an outbreak of the water. The water starts leaching through the, the surface of the soil and it starts mm -hmm. spilling over in the neighbor's yard and it gets into their well mm -hmm. and they can get very sick. So, you know. So, so there is actually a purpose to having a local health department. There is a purpose oh, for doing those routine makes inspections. Me feel so much better. Yeah. yeah, when people, <laughs> when you have to do a B100A before you expand your use of your septic system, there's a good reason for that. See, if you keep. Uh, talking about sanitarian job stuff, you're going to end up having sanitarian added to the, <laughs> and then you'll be all the way around the... In public health, we wear so many hats. You so, know that. So tell me, hepatitis A, is it really, really serious? Is it something we really should be concerned about? Uh, it, it is, it can be very serious. Okay. Not everybody who's exposed, and I'll use a few jargony terms that I'll explain to everybody. So when you're exposed to a virus, it just means you've come into contact with that virus. It's gotten into your body at some point. Now, not everybody who's exposed to the virus is going to get infected. That means the virus is actively replicating in them, right? They're infected. They, they've got the virus replicating. And still not everybody who's infected is going to get sick. Okay. So not everybody's going to show symptoms. And depending on your age and uh, and some other things, if you're sick, if you've already got liver disease, you may get a very mild form of hepatitis A, and you may get a very serious form of hepatitis A. Right. So some of the early symptoms are mild, nausea, loss of appetite, things like that, vomiting. Which typically we hear people saying, I have, uh, you know, I have foodborne illness. Food poisoning, right? Food Everybody poisoning, says food right? poisoning, food poisoning, right? It's like the generic catch-all for when you ate something and you start vomiting or having diarrhea later. Right. So hepatitis can cause some of those symptoms. And when you're young, so we see a lot of hepatitis in very young children. Mm -hmm. And those are usually the symptoms we see in young children. Most, most of the time when young kids get hepatitis A and get sick, they don't develop hepatitis. They don't develop this late symptom of liver disease. But when you're older, uh, most people who do get sick will progress to a serious form of hepatitis. So you'll start seeing dark colored urine, you'll start seeing clay colored stools, you'll be very weak, and then you'll start getting jaundice. So it's when your liver isn't processing the bilirubin in your body, you get yellowing skin and eyes. 
Uh, and some people will go on to into acute liver failure. And uh, thing you know you're on dialysis, is that? Well, I, unfortunately not. I mean, it, you, you uh, dialysis works really well for the kidneys, but there's no sort of great. Oh, that's true. There's no really great yeah. way to replicate the function of the liver. Oh. So when you you need your liver to live. I mean, yeah. uh, there are some organs that we we do a great job with modern medicine of mm. making sure you can live without like. If your kidneys aren't working well, you can get dialysis. Right. You can remove your gallbladder. You can remove your spleen and live a long, healthy life. Liver, Can't not so much. It. Yeah, not All so right. much. So if you're unlucky enough to get acute, like hepatic uh, hepatitis, yeah. you're gonna you're gonna be in trouble. So it can make some people very, very sick. So that's the real concern. People get very, very sick with hepatitis. So how prevalent is hepatitis A in the U.S. right now? It's not very prevalent, thank goodness. Good. The CDC reports about 20,000 cases a year in the United States. Yep. It's really not very common. 20,000 may sound like a big number to people, but when you have 350 million people in the country and you get right. 20,000 cases, it's really not a huge concern for most people. Mm -hmm. But because it can make some people very sick and because you can get clusters of cases in vulnerable people, uh, there's something we can do about it. I mean, that's why it's not just that it's a concern, but we can do something about it. Now, when you talk about clusters, what are types of clusters that you would see, especially around hepatitis A? Uh, so clusters, some people might like to use the word outbreak, but we'll just mm -hmm. say clusters of yeah. people who, who are from similar backgrounds or live in similar places. We see people who, we see clusters in people who are experiencing homelessness, mm -hmm. people who are uh, using recreational drugs, not just IV drugs. A lot of people think hepatitis, it's about sharing needles, but yeah. if you're sharing pipes and other, other implements for, for, of drug use, you can get hepatitis because, again, it's shed through feces, so mm -hmm. if I'm not using good hand hygiene, I'm you know, using a pipe and then I pass it to you, you can get hepatitis. Right. So we see it in drug users, we see it in men who have sex with men, we see it in uh, immigrant populations when they come to this country from parts of the world where hepatitis A, like I said, it's spreading sort of normally because they don't have good sanitary conditions with their water and their sewage. So it's not that person's fault, it's not that all people who come from other parts of the country here are contaminated with hepatitis and right. it's because they're dirty, it's not because they were unlucky enough to live in places where hygiene and sanitation was poor. And we live in a place where hygiene and sanitation is good. So tell me, you're, you're um, epidemiologist at a local health department. Somebody notifies you that there's this hepatitis A in one of your towns. How do you get notified? And then what is it that you do once you get notified? Hepatitis A is notifiable. It's mandatory for hospitals, healthcare providers, other physicians to, if they have a case of hepatitis A that they've diagnosed, to let us know. Uh, usually within 24 hours. It's, it's one of those infections that we have to be notified right away about. Okay. So when we get a call that hepatitis A, that we have a case of hepatitis A, that's one person with hepatitis A, yep. we go immediately and try to interview that person and we try to find out where did they maybe, where did they get hepatitis? Was it from food? We ask them a lot of questions about what they ate in the last few weeks. Um, what other kind of risk factors, more jargon, it just means what other kind of behaviors were they engaged in that might have given them hepatitis? If they were using drugs, where were they using drugs? Is it, is it safe to assume because of the populations you talked about that may have hepatitis or hepatitis A that they might be difficult to find, there may be language barriers, some of those other things that make it difficult to do what you're describing in terms of the epidemiology? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And communication is sometimes an issue and also sometimes depending on the the history of the person and the behavior that they might be engaging in that made them more likely to get hepatitis. Sometimes they may be guarded. They might not want to share everything with us. Uh, some people nowadays uh, are wary about sharing information, the personal information with the government. You know, here I'm the government. I'm asking all these personal questions. Who's your family? Who have you been spending time with? What have you been doing? So you're probably the same as me. I've always been shocked at how much people do share because if anybody yeah. calls me, I generally do what you described is, you know, hang up the phone. Right. Um, so the fact that somebody calls and asks you these very personal questions and they're out and they're willing to share that information, I always found that to be amazing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that people are that concerned about making sure, and generally it's they're concerned about making sure nobody else gets sick. That's right. And that's oh. the message that usually opens the door. Yeah. If you frame it that way, and we do, we say, uh, we're here to make sure that nobody else gets sick. Right. You know, my job is to make sure that nobody gets as sick as you are right now. And sometimes when we're doing these interviews, I'm sitting by a hospital bed with somebody who's very, very sick with acute hepatitis or liver failure. Right. So I think the message gets across in those cases because clearly they're very sick and they don't want other people to get sick. Right. And so we interview them and we find out uh, who they've been around. And then we really try to reach those people. You know, it's, it's really what we'll call contact tracing. You know, right. you're a person with hepatitis, okay? Let's draw a circle around you and say, who are your closest contacts? Because Hepatitis is chiefly spread through feces. So if you're living with somebody and they're not washing their hands often, 
you're a close contact with that person, you're more likely to have been exposed to the hepatitis virus from that person. And then we try to reach out to those people and tell them, you might have been exposed to hepatitis A virus. Right. And then we try to get them vaccinated. Now, why is it that hepatitis A is getting as much um, attention right now, considering that 20,000 out of the millions and millions of people um, are actually getting sick? Yeah, the, the CDC, uh, most of the time hepatitis, you know, you see outbreaks of hepatitis among, uh, in food. In 2016, there was a big nationwide outbreak in frozen strawberries, mm -hmm. okay. Um, that happens once a year or so. Uh, starting in about 2017, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, they started seeing uh, clusters or outbreaks in, in a lot of different pl places in the country among populations like people experiencing homelessness, people who are using drugs, and they saw an increase in the number of cases and an increase in the number of clusters of cases. So the CDC suggests that because there are clusters of cases among similar populations, mm -hmm. that there's some public health intervention that we can do about it. You know, we can't go and recommend that everybody who eats strawberries get vaccinated, right? right? right. You're talking about, you know, 200 million people who might eat strawberries, you can't vaccinate everybody. Right. But if you're talking about homeless populations or people who are struggling with substance abuse, these are very focused populations at risk. And in public health terms, we can do something about that. We can try to reach those people and get them vaccinated. But so that's, that's why you're hearing more about hepatitis A is because we've seen more outbreaks, more clusters among these small focused but high risk populations. So tell me more about the vaccination process and, and who it is that's being targeted um, and what the vaccine is gonna provide them once they get vaccinated. So we're really lucky. There, this vaccine, hepatitis A vaccine, is one of the best vaccines available. Just a single dose, an intramuscular injection into the arm, mm -hmm. or with alcohol, one shot, that's it, uh, can provide 10 years of immunity, just one va one shot, 10 years of immunity or more yeah. for about 85% of people who get that one shot. It's recommended they get two shots. And after two shots, so they're spaced about six months apart, you yeah. get one shot, then a second shot six months later. After two shots, it's thought that just about everybody who's had those two shots will be immune for their lifetime. So it's a really great vaccine. It's really effective. The side effects are minimal. So. That's the process. We try to find people who might be at risk for getting hepatitis, who may have been exposed to hepatitis, give them just the one shot even, mm -hmm. then recommend they get the second shot six months later. So maybe the silly question is, why don't we all get this shot? Ah, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. And I think the vaccine was released in the mid to late 1990s, 1996, 1997. Mm -hmm. About 10 years later, the recommendation was made that all children at year one be vaccinated for hepatitis A. And the reason is most, to that point, most of the outbreaks that we saw were among daycares. So because it spread through feces, you can imagine a bunch of kids running around in a daycare with diapers. Right. They're not washing their hands very well, right? They're scratching their butts or whatever. Right. So we would see a lot of outbreaks among in daycares. Mm. So it was recommended that children at one year of age get vaccinated. So now really we do vaccinate just about everybody in this country, depending on where you live, most people, if they're going to daycare or kindergarten or preschool, they're getting a shot of, of hepatitis A vaccine. So, so we're kind of going in that direction. We're starting to vaccinate just about everybody starting at, at a very young age. But as adults, you know, for you and I, the vaccine wasn't around when we were in preschool. So right. if we're in a high risk setting, you know, um, for me, I got the vaccine because I'm investigating cases of hepatitis A. I'm around people with hepatitis A sometimes, so I got the vaccine. Um, but right now, it's really just, just children. We're focused on children and these people who are at high risk for getting the vaccine. That's where the focus is. It's actually interesting you bring that up because the um, discussion we had in the office was who's the priority group? Who's the high risk person? Is it firefighters? Is it police officers? Is it ambulance people? Is it- It is know, those EMS? people. Yeah, is, are those the right people that we should target? I think so, because those are people who are responding to people who may be in these high risk populations. Mm -hmm. So then if you're, uh, if you're examining somebody for a wound or an illness or something, when you're a first responder, you come to somebody, somebody's unconscious, mm -hmm. and you have to do CPR on them, or you have to give them, uh, you have to spray Narcan in their nose. You know, sometimes people, uh, in those settings will get exposed. So if you're a first responder responding to people who might be sick with hepatitis, right. whether they know it or not, those are high risk. So right. yes, certainly first responders, certainly people who are experiencing homelessness, certainly people who are using drugs recreationally, those are sort of those high risk populations we want to focus on. Now, I remember uh, being in Massachusetts a number of years ago where there was an outbreak of hepatitis A at a restaurant, uh -huh. and they became uh, concerned enough to start proactively vaccinating all their employees. Um, and then a lot of their employees didn't want to work there because they didn't want to get a shot. Uh, but when you think about the fact that, you know, food service workers have that potential, uh, does that make sense or is that a little overkill, do you think? Well, I think in a setting where there's an 
outbreak, and yep. it's an active or ongoing outbreak where the people who are working in a restaurant where there was an outbreak, those people might have actually been exposed. You right. know, let's say there was one person who was working at the restaurant and they were cutting lettuce and onions for the salad bar and they got a bunch of people sick. Well, mm -hmm. the people who work there, they may have also eaten, this, eaten at the salad bar right. or they may have also had a sandwich that had lettuce on it. And either way, they're sharing a bathroom with that other employee, right? right. So in that specific case, I think it makes a lot of sense to vaccinate all the employees. But moving forward proactively over the next five years to mm -hmm. vaccinate every new employee that comes in there, it's really unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Even though food workers are, are, the, are likely, if they have hepatitis A, to transmit it to people who get, who eat the food that they're preparing, mm -hmm. food workers are not at increased risk for getting hepatitis generally. Right. So, so there's a, I don't think it really would be recommended to just vaccinate all food workers. And again, you know, I think most food workers are probably uh, getting drilled on the whole wash your hands, wash, wash your hands, hands, wash your hands. Right. If they're Wear doing the gloves, <laughs> if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, washing their hands, wearing gloves, changing their gloves, they're, they, they shouldn't in theory be transmitting hepatitis A to people <laughs> if they do what they're supposed to. Now, if I wanted to get hepatitis A vaccine, Joe Public, I want to talk to my doctor about it. Um, is it something that's going to be an out-of-pocket expense? Is it something typically insurance would cover? Um, yeah. I know there's been vaccination clinics. Is that free? Is there a charge associated with it? Depends on where you go. Okay. So, for example, I know the Uncas Health District, the Ledgelite Health District, and there are a lot of other health departments and health districts in Connecticut mm -hmm. that are doing free vaccine clinics right. for people, for people high risk, people in high risk settings. Yeah. So, so in that case, so if you came to, to us or, or to you, you would get it for free. You're not, you're not going to be charged. Right. Um, if you're, if you don't want to come to the public health department's public vaccine clinic, you know they carry it at the CVS minute clinics. You know a lot of the pharmacies do a lot of vaccinations. Now you can get that. You'll be charged for it, right. or they'll charge your insurance. Right. So depending on where you go, if you speak to your primary care provider, they probably have the vaccine because again, one-year-olds, a lot of one-year-olds are getting the vaccine. So a lot of primary care practices will carry it. Again, your insurance, if you have it, will be billed. And otherwise, you know, if you come to one of the public health departments that are doing it, do it for free, so even if you have insurance. If you're down the street from the health department, you hear they're doing a clinic, just come by. You know, it's that easy. Now, remind me of the phone number for Ledgelite. So if people had questions in the Ledgelite Health District area, who would they call? Uh, for Ledgelite Health District, they can call 860-448-4882, yep. and they can ask to speak to our nurse, our public health nurse, who's organizing the vaccine clinics. So, Uncas Health District, 860-823-1189, same thing, ask to speak to the public health nurse. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of nice that we don't have to worry about it. We just tell the nurse to... That's Take right. Care of everything. And for me, you know, I was there when we were doing a clinic and I got vaccinated. Sure, I could have gone to my primary care physician and right. scheduled a visit, but she was given the vaccine at the time. And, you know, especially in the setting, you know, we were vaccinating a vulnerable population. And there were some people who were skeptical about getting the vaccine. And they asked me if I was going to get the vaccine. Now, the real answer was, yes, I was planning on getting the vaccine, but I wanted to make sure that all of them had, we had enough vaccine to vaccinate everybody. Um, so what I said was, well, if there's enough vaccine left over, I'm gonna get the shot. But I think it's comforting for people who may be a little bit skeptical that sort of a regular Joe might be getting the vaccine because you know I look at myself as at high risk, you know? It is true though that once you got the vaccine, that's when the beard developed, isn't that correct? It was like overnight, I tell you. <laughs> it's like, I mean, this is nothing three days you may, ago. You may wanna question your position <laughs> on whether or not you will also grow a beard if you have <laughs> hepatitis vaccine. So tell me the role of an epidemiologist at a local health department or health district, because I know that's not something that's always that common yeah. uh, to find. It should be. Well, yeah. and in fact, we don't have one, so we just borrow you when we need it. <laughs> <laughs> so the role of an epidemiologist is, I, I like to think of an epidemiologist sort of um, one part statistician and one part storyteller. Yeah. And so really the role is to monitor the health of the population. Oftentimes we do that by, by calculating statistics, you know, we, like I said, we get reports from physicians about a lot of things besides hepatitis A. We get reports of Lyme disease, cases of Lyme disease, we get reports of uh, salmonella, you know, another kind of foodborne illness. So we get the, all these reports and the overall role of the epidemiologist is to say, okay, let's look at all the things that are making our population sick or killing them. Mm -hmm. And let's see, are the rates going up of viral hepatitis? Are the rates going down? Um, in what populations do we see these things? So the who, what, when and where, you know? When do we see outbreaks? Who's getting these diseases? And it's my function to basically look at the numbers and make recommendations to, to the, the director of health to say, okay, look, we're seeing a problem here with this particular disease, whether it's hepatitis, something else. Right. And here's what we can do about it. So I have to take these numbers and I have to help make sense of them. You know, we get all these reports and numbers come in all the time. And right. part of my job is to be a storyteller to sort of tell people what's going on. 
that you could put a table up on a screen and you can say, isn't this egregious what's happening? And half the people will look at your table and say, I don't understand what you're talking about. Right. So it's my role to at least try to interpret those numbers for people so they understand. Now, since you started at Ledgelate, are you finding um, there's better data out there or is it relatively the same? Are you finding that um, you know, things like electronic medical records and uh, the computerization of your work is helpful? Or are you finding that there's just so much information out there it just gets confusing for people? It's both of those things. Okay. You know, as, as uh, I mean, we work in public health and local public health departments, uh, we don't have a lot of staff. Even though Legislative Health District has an epidemiologist, you know, we really have roughly 25 staff doing all, a whole host of things. Right. So we can't do everything because we're minimally staffed. So we look at all this data and we say, yeah, there's a lot out there. There's a lot of data. Electronic health records do help. Yeah. Um, from my perspective, it, it's much easier to get a spreadsheet that's very well organized with data rather than a, a piece of paper that, you know, has a name and, a, and an address and the disease, and then I have to take that piece of paper and put it into a database myself and type it up. So that process still happens, unfortunately. We still get a lot of paper reports. Well, I was going to say, the funny part is we'll have a conversation with people and say, can't you email that to me? And they'll say, well, HIPAA doesn't allow or, or the you know, regulations don't allow for me to, to email that to right. you. But wouldn't that be the fastest way? No, but unfortunately, we can't do it that way. And you know, I'd love to get rid of the fax machine, but a lot of stuff still comes by fax. That's so, right, because um, it's, kind of, it's confidential. Right, so that's the interesting part, is that balance between getting something right away, immediate, being able to do something with it, and then protecting people's confidentiality. That's right, and, and you know, some of the work that we do is aided by electronic health records. If we want to look at a lot of data, for example, and we get an extract of electronic health records with 50,000 records, we need software to look at that and, and, and understand it. Right. But a lot of what we do in public health still is stuff that was being done 250 years ago, which is, right. you know, you hear from a doctor that there's this strange case of something and the doctor calls the health department and the health department investigates. Right. I mean, that's what happens with hepatitis. We get one report, comes on a piece of paper or a phone call, and then we go and we do shoe leather epidemiology. We just go out and we talk to people and we find the people who they mention who might have been exposed to whatever they have and we try to vaccinate them or, or educate them about the disease they might have been exposed to. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the stuff has nothing to do with electronic health records. You know, the routine surveillance that we're doing, surveillance is another jargony term where it just means monitoring the, the health of a population, mm -hmm. you know, on a population level. That's surveillance. So the, that kind of surveillance, it's great when you have electronic health records. Mm -hmm. You can get a lot of data and do a lot of analysis and, and it's, it's much faster that way. But those acute moments, you know, where there are outbreaks, right. getting a single phone call or, or a report that comes over on the fax sometimes is better than waiting for a monthly extract from some database at the hospital that might, that might come. Well, tell me, you, I know you had had the, um, you know, kind of crisscross the emergency functions and the epidemiology at one point and created this team that would go out and do an epidemiological investigation. Can you tell me more about that? Because I think yeah. that's a great way to move from that daily, every day looking at epidemiology to, oh my God, we have something going on and we have to get mm -hmm. out there and deal with it. Well, like I said, and like you know, health departments are kind of understaffed. It's just me, I'm the one epidemiologist. I don't have, or I didn't anyway, a team of people who can go out into the community and help me find contacts for a hepatitis A case or something like that. Right. So, so I, we started um, a, a group called the Epi Strike Team, and basically it's a group of uh, Medical Reserve Corps volunteers these are medical and non-medical people who volunteer to be part of this medical reserve corps. Through the health district. Through the health district. Yeah, every health district has a medical health, medical reserve corps. And we train them in how to do structured interviews. We train them how to um, make phone calls and educate people about particular diseases. And we train them in how to get out into the community and sample populations. That means if we think, for example, after there's been a hurricane, and there's been a lot of flooding, like you see what's going on in North Carolina and they're worried about pig farms flooding, you know, contaminated water. Well, what happens to the people who live in those places and, and how do you make sure they're, they're healthy? You can't make all those phone calls. So mm -hmm. this particular specially trained group has been trained to go out into communities after a disaster like a hurricane and knock on, strategically knock on certain doors so that we get a good representative sample of a whole population just by knocking on a couple hundred doors. And they were trained to do that, how to do that, what questions to ask, to gather that information in a day or two so we can get a picture back of the health of a population in an emergency, like mm -hmm. after a hurricane. Because sometimes, you know, we operate shelters, say, during a hurricane, and one or two people come into the shelter and they start screaming about what's happening. But that's one loud voice who managed to get out of their neighborhood. So right. that's not a population level look at what's really going on. Somebody might say, oh my God, you know, I need 
medicine and batteries and I didn't have any food and so you mobilize all these resources, food and batteries and medicine, you go out there and really what people need is water to flush their toilets because the power's out right. and, they're, you know, and their pump's not working because right. they got a well. So right. to, to go out there, we trained all these people to get out there and do a little shoe leather epidemiology to, to do a, I guess what I could call some surge, to provide some surge capacity for those big events where you're really worried about a lot of people who might need something and you want to get a snapshot of your population. So we have about five minutes left, actually about four minutes left. Um, the hepatitis A issue that we're dealing with now, do you think if we target it the right way, we'll be able to make a big impact? I think if we target it the right way, we'll be able to make an impact in terms of preventing outbreaks or clusters of hepatitis A. Okay. I think in terms of preventing all cases of hepatitis A, I think we're doing the right thing with vaccinating young children. Right. So it depends on how you, what you've, how you define big impact. Yeah. I think if we don't, we've had outbreaks in other parts of the country of, of hepatitis A besides among preschool children, among you know, people experiencing homelessness, people using recreational drugs. I think if we target the right populations at the right times and the right places, we can make a big impact in preventing outbreaks. I wouldn't be surprised if we do a good enough job. We don't see an outbreak among people experiencing homelessness. Right. I mean, I, I think we can do a very good job. There are a lot of good health departments around the state of Connecticut, and so I think we could. In terms of reducing that overall number of 20,000, yeah. I think vaccinating the kids is probably the way to go. Yeah. So last couple minutes, I wanted to ask the epidemiologist in you, you commented that you're one of the few in the, in the health districts, you're one of the, uh, the lone in southeastern <laughs> Connecticut. How do we start educating people on the need for epidemiology and do you work or do you ever um, uh, connect with st schools, students um, to try to get them into the field? Yeah, so uh, part of the role of public health is educating the next generation's workforce. Right. So, so we do, and if anybody calls Legislative Health District, for example, and says, uh, I, want a, I want a presentation about what public health is and what epidemiology is, I do that, and I have done that for schools in the past. Uh, we don't necessarily take a proactive stance where we're doing, besides during Public Health Week, which there is a Public Health Week, right. and we do some things around Public Health Week where we try to get information out there. Um, but yeah, we do do some of that. I think it's important for people to understand that the reason we have sanitarians out there doing inspections of restaurants is because of epidemiology. It's yep. because that at one point, hundreds of years ago, we learned through doing epidemiologic studies of people who got sick with various diseases that, oh, this is how they got sick. They got sick through food or contaminated water. And if you heat food to a certain temperature, you kill this particular thing and you stop a lot of people from getting sick. So you know, epidemiology is the scientific backbone of everything we do in public health. Everything we've done, everything we do, everything we will do is going to be supported by good science and public health, that good science epidemiology. So I must admit that when I was going for my master's, I had to do the epi and biostats. <laughs> and that was the toughest part of my entire <laughs> master's program was trying to do that epi biostats. And I think, you know, there's certain people who think certain ways. Yeah. There's a certain, you know, logical thought process that has to happen with that field. Yeah. Um, and for whatever reason, that's not my thing. That's it. But I bet <laughs> you did great in the policy and the workforce development health and, law, and, yeah, and assurance, health, health yeah. law. And po <laughs> I'm sure you did a bang up. I struggled in health law and ethics, you know, not that I'm not an ethical oh person. Oh, my goodness. But I, the <laughs> the class was combined. I know. Okay. <laughs> so, so I struggled in certain areas and epidemiology and biostatistics, it just came to me naturally. And, and, and it was kind of, that was the easiest part for me. I wanted to take as many of those classes as I could. And I think, I think my point from saying that is that, you know, I think the great part about Legislate, Uncas, departments like ours is we recognize where we are strong and we recognize where we're weak and we tend to work very well together mm -hmm. amongst ourselves with the state health department. Um, so there's always that support, and yeah. you know, I think it's important for the public to hear that piece. Yeah, I mean, there are jurisdictional boundaries, and technically I'm not allowed to get a report of, for example, hepatitis A from somebody in Norwich in my, in my health department, but right. if you had an outbreak of hepatitis A, you better be sure that, you know, if you called us and asked our director, can I get some support, he'd send me up to help you. So, right. so and we do that all the time. I mean, our, our medical reserve corps, the units, they do things together all the time. Vaccine right. clinics, they do together all the time. So, you know... There might be jurisdictional issues, but we work together really well when it comes to public health crises in particular because we need each other. Well, and I think the one thing I keep hearing in public health is that uh, you know public health issues don't reflect the boundaries. <laughs> not at all. You know, if you live in Groton and you go to dinner in Norwich, that doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to get sick. And likewise, um, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to kind of have to work together. Yeah, we have to absolutely. Right. If there's a case of hepatitis A, and I do an investigation and I find out that 
they were close contacts with a dozen people, you know, half of them might not be in my jurisdiction. So I need to make sure I can get that information to you if there was somebody in your jurisdiction, tell them where that person was been, the context in which they might have been exposed, so that you can then take up the mantle and go and find that person and connect them with, with care. Right. You know, in, in New London, I might not know where to send somebody for a particular treatment or vaccine, mm. but if I call you because it's a person in Norwich, I say, Patrick, this, this person, they're a close contact, somebody with hepatitis A, you need to reach out to them and connect them with care. You're going to be the person to do that because you know what's going on in this area. So. And when I call Russ and I ask him to be on the TV show, Russ says absolutely, <laughs> and here he is today. <laughs> so I want to thank you very much for being on the show. Sure. Um, hopefully in another year we'll look back and say there's no outbreaks of hepatitis A ever because we do such a great job in local public That's health. That's the goal. And uh, I didn't even ask Russ to grow the beard so we would match today, <laughs> but he did it, and that was wonderful. <laughs> so. We'll see you next episode of Public Health Matters with the Uncas Health District. Thanks to Russ, and we'll see you next time.